Hello, BookTube. Well, as you know, I'm part of Book Trek 2021. This is a five-month reading mission that I'm embarked on with a bunch of other BookTubers where we're reading Star Trek fiction. All, this, all the fiction, all the novels that are spun off from the various first five iterations of Star Trek. So we started in August with the original series, my Star Trek, and read a ton of stuff there together and talked all about it. And then we moved on to the next generation, uh, which was a Star Trek that very much wasn't mine. I didn't, I didn't like it when it was coming out. I Subsequent revisits did nothing for me. But Book Trek changed that. Book Trek fixed Star Trek The Next Generation for me. I suddenly saw all sorts of ways to appreciate it. That was great. But what uh, the great bird of the galaxy giveth, he also taketh away. Because we then moved on to Deep Space Nine, which was a Star Trek franchise I thought I loved, and now I hate it virulently and don't ever want anyone to mention it in the same room with me, because I could not find a single Deep Space Nine novel that was worth the paper it was printed on. When all you Star Trek fans will know, I was really looking for something that was worth its weight in gold-pressed latinum. <laughs> Just a nerd things up. But now, for November, we're moving on. We're not sticking with Deep Space Nine forever. I admit there were times when I would take brief naps, and I would have dreams in which that actually was happening, but it's not. We're moving on to Star Trek Voyager. Now, we talked about Voyager a little bit last time. Uh, in one way, this is a radical departure for series Star Trek, because the USS Voyager, under the command of Captain Captain Janeway, has no superstructure support. Voyagers thrown literally across the galaxy, 80,000 light years. So all of a sudden, there's no Starfleet, there's no fellow captains, there are no admirals to check things with, there's no nothing. No allies, either. Totally unknown region of space. In that way, it was very different. But in, in other ways, it was, very, it, it was a throwback to very similar things that happened in the original show and The Next Generation. Suddenly, we're back on a starship, for instance. Deep Space Nine wasn't like that. Suddenly, we're going from planet to planet, week by week. Suddenly, there is an overarching story. Janeway solemnly swears that she will get her crew back home before they all die of old age. Uh, that she'll somehow find a way to do that. So at the back of every story is that, is that idea. So that's the reason why when the crew of Voyager finds a beautiful, welcoming, paradisical world, they don't just set up shop. That's the reason why, because it's their goal to get back home. But... Apart from that, and in a lot of episodes of the show, that is barely mentioned. Apart from that, you do go on, you do go back to the formula of show by show by show, with no larger drama interfering in many ways. We mentioned uh, in the original series there were no larger dramas. And in The Next Generation, there were only the faintest hints of them. The Enterprise meets the Borg, and they meet Q. And anytime those two things crop up in an episode, you are expected to remember the last time they cropped up in an episode. But other than that, it's all it's all pretty much different from, from week to week. Deep Space Nine, very much not like that. Deep Space Nine started to build a big storyline, the Federation at war. So if you plopped in in the fifth episode of the sixth season, you would have no idea what was going on. You might recognize some of the characters, but you would know you were coming in in the middle of a story. That was new for Star Trek. And that doesn't happen with Voyager. The larger story with Voyager is that they're trying to get home. The closest that it comes with Voyager is, of course, something that Star Trek fans knew when the original story ideas for Voyager were being brooded around in Starlog magazine. The Voyager gets flung to the Delta Quadrant of the galaxy. Star Trek fans know that word, that place, for only one thing. They know that's where the Borg live. <laughs> they know that's where the Borg live. So they know that if Voyager keeps going, sooner or later they're going to encounter the Borg. But they don't for a long time. In the show, they don't for a long time. And when they do, the showrunners decided to go all in by introducing a new character, a human woman, that Voyager rescues from the Borg. They deprogram her. They remove her, blo her Borg implants. Uh, and that, that we'll, get, we'll be getting to that character a lot. We'll be, her name, of course, is Seven of Nine. She keeps her Borg de designation. She doesn't go back to using her human name, even though Voyager does discover her human identity. She keeps her name and just shortens it to Seven. And she starts to embrace the idea of reclaiming her lost humanity. And a lot of great things happen as a result of that. The, but the reason why it happens in the middle of the show's run is due to a cosmic phenomenon more nefarious than the Borg. And that is ratings. <laughs> the Voyager's ratings were starting to slip a little. 
That never happened with The Next Generation. It was phenomenally popular from beginning to end. And it didn't have time to happen with the original show. Or God knows what they would have done. God knows what Roddenberry would have done. But, but with Voyager, Voyager had the... Op Deep Space Nine, for instance, was on TV long enough for its ratings to start to slip. And when the ratings on Deep Space Nine started to slip, the producers came up with a solution, a very simple solution. A solution that was so simple that it came out as a proverb in one of their story sessions, and they actually put it in the mouth of a character on the show because it, was, it made perfect sense. Some of you will know what I'm talking about. The, there's a rift be, that's growing between the Federation and the Klingon Empire. They're allies. But there's a rift that's growing. And when Benjamin Sisko, the captain of Deep Space Nine, realizes that this rift is just going to keep getting worse, he says that an old friend of his once told him that in the end, the only people who can deal with Klingons are Klingons. <laughs> and that was the solution to Deep Space Nine's slight slip in the ratings. Get Michael Dorn as Worf from The Next Generation and put him in the show, and it worked. Their solution to the a slight slippage in the ratings for Star Trek Voyager was to add a Borg character who becomes a de facto part of the crew. The showrunners weren't confident enough to let that decision alone. That decision is great, but they weren't confident enough to let it alone. Instead, it just so happens that Seven of Nine is gorgeous. <laughs> I mean gorgeous. Jerry Ryan's the name of the actor, the actress who plays Seven of Nine. And to give her all the props that she deserves, this is not the last time we're going to see this gimmick, but to give her all the props that she deserves, she's fantastic. An absolutely fantastic job as this character. But she was also extremely easy on the eyes, and that helped a lot. That helped a lot to give a little turbocharge to the ratings. Uh, Jerry Ryan has since made some some veiled diplomatic comments about what it was like to work with Kate Mulgrew, the actress who played Captain Catherine Janeway. Kate Mulgrew is an old-style, uh, Hollywood-style diva. It can't have been a picnic <laughs> to suddenly be sharing lots and lots of scenes with her. But uh, we're, not, we're not there yet. We'll be talking about that. But that's the closest that you come to an overarching story in Voyager is either the long trip home or the introduction of Seven of Nine. And when you're writing Voyager fiction, well, that will be an easy demarcation line. And Voyager fiction is what we're dealing with, because I've read four Voyager novels. I was going to stop with just one. I read this. This is by Eric Kotani. So I guess he's a Kazon. <laughs> the Kazon mister? I don't know. And this is Death of a Neutron Star. Uh, with the, the dorky old covers. This is a very early Star Trek Voyager novel when the show was still on. When the show was, I think, in its second season, something like that. Very early on, you can still see because this has, there is Kate Mulgrew as Catherine Captain Janeway wearing what fans affectionately dubbed the Bun of Steel. <laughs> She's wearing her hair up in a Catherine Hepburn-esque bun as opposed to down along the sides of her face. That is an easy way to tell where a story is set. <laughs> One of the easy ways to tell. The, the other easy way to tell is whether or not Seven of Nine is part of the show. Because there are many, many seasons where she's not. Uh, and this is early on that no one on the crew even has encountered the Borg. They don't have any idea that Seven of Nine is in the future. The writer of the book didn't know because it hadn't happened yet. But this is really, really good. It's The heart of the story is a group of aliens who are all warring over uh, one particular amazing astrometric discovery stars in a certain area of space that simply aren't acting the way they should. And it could be really good news or really bad news. It could wipe out all life in their in their sector of the of their solar system. But lurking behind so many of the plot lines in these books is the chance that it could help Voyager. That if enough of these neutron stars collapsed at the same time, maybe they could create a stable wormhole back to the Alpha Quadrant. Maybe that that doesn't come up often in this book, but it is definitely there in the background. And all the characters are done really, really well. There, there wasn't much for, uh, what's his name again? Eric Kotani. There wasn't much for him to work with. He just had the seasons of the show, almost no backstory. But uh, what he has to work with, he captures pitch perfect. Uh, all the characters in this are pitch perfect. Even the ones that fans didn't like. Because keep in mind, Voyager has a very varied cast. Even before Seven of Nine shows up, you've got Starfleet officers like the captain. You've got uh, Marquis officers who were Voyage was originally sent out in the first episode to find to hunt down a Marquis vessel. They're terrorists. They're preying on 
ships in the demilitarized zone between the Federation and the Cardassian Empire. And unbeknownst to this particular ship of Marquis people, Janeway has implanted her own spy as a member of their crew. Uh, Lieutenant Tuvok, who is her best friend and a hundred-year-old Vulcan. And when, when he finally reveals this to them, it's too late. They have been caught up in the same phenomenon that threw Voyager across the galaxy. Uh, and as if that weren't wrinkle enough, the two main Maquis characters, Chakotay and Belana Torres, who is half Klingon, were originally Starfleet. They defected from Starfleet. They have all the training. They have all the impulses of Starfleet. So you've got all of that, but then you also have uh, when Voyager's flung across the galaxy, it blows out all sorts of bulkheads and circuits. The ship is damaged. And in one of those explosions, not only is Janeway's first officer killed, but her doctor is killed. And there is no other. They're not anywhere near Federation space anymore. So they activate the emergency medical hologram which is only meant to help. It's a sort of, in sickbay, it's sort of a solid light construction hologram that is meant to help. It's meant to augment a doctor in like a triage situation, an emergency situation. But there's no other doctor. So the holographic doctor, who's never named, uh, just becomes a member of the crew. He's just active all the time. And in addition to that, Voyager's no sooner in the Delta Quadrant than they encounter an inhabitant of the Delta Quadrant and his girlfriend and take them on board, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So it's a very mixed crew. It's a difficult thing for a writer to get all of that right. And uh, what's his name again? I'm not familiar with the case on this. Eric Kotani does a really good job of that. And I was going to stop there, but I was in a science fiction mood because of uh, NaNoWriMo, because I'm writing science fiction for NaNoWriMo. Uh, so I went to uh, a different Star Trek Voyager novel. I thought, oh, I'm in the mood, so I'll just read another Star Trek Voyager novel. I want to show you that one. Yes, here we go. Uh, this thing. This is by Jeffrey Lang. It's called String Theory, Volume 1, Part 1. And I don't like the cover design. That is Belana Torres, the half-Klingon chief engineer of Voyager. And I, uh, I thought, well, I don't like the cover design. And also, see up top there where it says 10th Anniversary Odyssey? That was a decision on Pocketbook's part to, to start commissioning novels for these shows 10 years after they premiered. In other words, three years after they'd gone off the air. Uh, to sort of help, just, it just as service to the fans. Fans who wanted more adventures of these characters were getting these 10th anniversary novels. And the reason why that gave me pause is because although all of the Deep Space Nine novels that I read were puke-worthy, the ones that were most puke-worthy were the 10th anniversary novels. So I thought, oh my god, but this was great. Absolutely great, and even better, with the author, uh, Jeffrey Lang, nailing the characters. It really did, I could hear the, the, the voices of the actors saying these lines. No one was out of character, the pacing was extremely well done, which is rare when you're talking about a first volume in a trilogy. Uh, so I, uh, <laughs> some of you are already going to know how this story ends. I went on and read the rest of the trilogy. I'll show you the other covers, the other two covers. Here is... Uh, Book two, and there is uh, Lieutenant Tuvok, the 100-year-old Vulcan uh, that is Janeway's security officer and also her closest friend. That's another uh, callback to earlier Star Trek incarnations that the showrunners of Voyager did. They decided, once again, we will explore the dynamic of what happens when a human has a Vulcan as a best friend. We saw that on the original Star Trek show, only Tuvok is not half-human. He's... And he's not 30. He's not the same age as his friend. Instead, he's three times Catherine Janeway's age and full Vulcan. And yet, the two actors do a great, great job. Some of my favorite moments in seven years of watching Voyager are, are just the manifestation of that relationship. And the story just keeps going. As you can tell from the title, String Theory, this deals with all sorts of quantum stuff. This, the plot line is almost impossible to synopsize, but it, because the writer, this is... Uh, Kirsten Beyer, because the writer, the writers of String Theory don't understand String Theory, they're able to, woo, to weave in a whole bunch of quasi-mystical woo and get their way. In fact, it wasn't long in this book, in, I think, book one, it wasn't long when, with, with the loosey-goosey science, where I was thinking, surely Q is going to show up in this book, and he does. <laughs> so, so, and then let me show you uh, book number three. I just blasted through all of these things. Uh, so I'm done with String Theory now. Do I have... Uh, Oh, God, did I put String Theory Volume 3 somewhere else where I can't find it? Uh, I think I did. I think it's in some other folder. Well, it doesn't matter anyway. The point is, 
that my uh, book track 2021 f for Star Trek Voyage was off to a roaring start <laughs> because I read four books and loved them all. Uh, I view String Theory as really one book despite having three different authors because they they must have talked with each other a lot. They do a seamless job. Uh, so I wanted all of you to know we were you were all joking. I was joking in the month of October. Uh, the Deep Space Nine was cursed. <laughs> I wanted you to know that that curse appears to be lifted. I am now ready to read negative, to read poor Voyager novels. I'm now ready because, remember how October started, I read a Deep Space Nine novel, made a video, talked to you and said, oh, well, it was really bad, but I had, well, I'm daunted, we'll go on tomorrow, and then you just saw me droop and droop and droop. Well, that's not happening now. I've got, I've got a great turbo boost to start me off. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up for now. I, I'm assuming that sometime in November, some of my co-hosts will poke out their heads and make some videos. But I'm having a blast, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> uh, but I'll wrap this up for now. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two. <laughs>